a seat. If you're up the back, come down to the front. We're gonna make room for more people to come in. Welcome everybody. My name is Faye and I just wanna say Merry Christmas. Merry Welcome Christmas. home. We're glad you're here at Lighthouse, whether it's your first time or your hundredth time, we're glad that you're here. Um, just really quickly, I wanna let you know ways that you can connect in here. You can come join us on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We're here every Sunday. We also live stream on YouTube, so you can join in online. You can join us for prayer meeting beforehand at 9.20 as well. Um, and when the new year comes, when we come back in the new year, we'll have connect groups on Tuesday evenings from 7 p.m. and encounter nights starting in February, every second and fourth Friday. Um, just a quick note to let you know, this is our Christmas service. We won't be having one tomorrow, but next Sunday, we will be having a Thanksgiving service to wrap up the year. Um, so if you've got a testimony you wanna share, please come and chat to me after. We'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah. Welcome. Before we quickly kick off, if you call Lighthouse Home, this is how you can bring your tithe into this house, um, or you can come and put your um, offering in the baskets up the front. All right, guys. I think John's going to read us a verse before we kick off. <laughs> Thanks, John. Again, so yeah, Isaiah six. Isaiah nine six. Nine six. Sorry. <laughs> it's a very good one. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. The Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Joy to the world. Woo! <laughs> Joy to the world, for he has came.
joyful we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, only to oh, one last the joyful, joyful. Join with the angels, join with the angels. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King, peace on Sure. 
all the highest praise, all the glory, the honor belong to Him. We sing.
You bow. Hallelujah. Every time confess, Jesus is Lord. At your name, every knee you bow. Every time confess, Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, He is Lord. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Lift the name of Jesus in this place. Thank you, Lord. No other name but your name. Salvation, Lord. Oh, we're so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful. Oh, we hail the King of Kings. Oh, you deserve the glory. It's come out a few times already today, Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is given. Sorry, a child is born, unto us a son is given. And Father, today we, as we pause to remember the birth of your son, Jesus. Father, I pray every heart in this place will be unveiled by your Spirit as the truth of your word gets presented today, that you adjust our hearts, shift our hearts, remove hurt, anxiety, Lord, unbelief, whatever it is, Lord God, that our hearts will have a shift today. There will be a shift in our hearts, Lord, so we can see you, Jesus, as you truly are. As we celebrate you being born on this day, we remember that you didn't stay a babe, that you are the resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. And that's why we celebrate today that you are alive. You defeated death. You forgave us all our sins, Lord. And for that we celebrate. We give you all the glory today, Lord. Come have your way in this place. Father, I pray today through your Spirit, Touch every person whom you love. Jesus, whom you died for on the cross. Touch them by your Spirit. Reveal Jesus to them by your Spirit. Fill them with your love today. Let them see you like they've never seen you before. Open our eyes today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout today. Thank you, Lord. Well, maybe after, after the service, we can continue to celebrate. How many you know Christmas is all about celebrating, but celebrating for the right reasons, yeah? 
And today we're going to hear and we're going to be reminded of what Christmas is really all about. And uh, we're going to hear from, from the Word today. Why don't you, where you are right now, just say hello to someone. Say welcome to the service this morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it from across the street, across our city, across the globe. Welcome. Those watching on YouTube, we welcome you. Hey, amazing. Well, wonderful. Welcome, everyone, to our Christmas Eve slash Christmas service. There's no service tomorrow, just in case you're wondering. But uh, feel free to hang around for some refreshments after the service. Get to know us. If you're visiting us, welcome to all of us. Merry Christmas. May we enjoy this season and really celebrate what it's really about. And I pray refreshing and encouragement and lots of joy and peace. And um, we're going to get into a message in the moment. But uh, Rocco has just come back from the glory realm. <laughs> no, he's come back from um, country New South Wales. So I'm just going to ask him to just share briefly what, what happened. It's good for us to be aware of what God's doing uh, through the lives of people in the church and what we're about, and it's good for us to pray and also partner into the future. So we want to make what Rocco's doing available to other people that can come and be part of what we're doing. So um, over to you, Rocco. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, the worship was powerful, huh? How beautiful. Very nice. Um, yes, uh, the church is involved with um, Yibamara Foundation. Yibamara Foundation is a... Um, it's going out to all the indigenous areas, the New South Wales. We start with New South Wales, then we'll grow into other areas, of course, uh, Victoria and Queensland next. But with New South Wales, we've done a bush Christmas, got involved with a lot of corporates. Um, the church is also involved in, in a lot of ways. Um, we went out to Peak Hill, which is between Dubbo and Parks. Peak Hill's a hub. And Peak Hill does 13 remote areas. Those remote areas don't even see food half of the time. So we supply food. Now, Bush Christmas was Christmas presents. Um, t- even there's one remote area that's just two hours outside of Burke on the other side. They've never seen a present before, an actual Christmas present. So to them, they were so excited. Um, so it goes to Peak Hill. 13 remote areas. We do Lake Angelico, which is Murrum Bridge, which is further towards the, the um, border of um, South Australia. And it's a beautiful spot. Great lake. Again, uh, minimal, minimal, minimal um, food and anything resembling of Christmas to them. So when we arrived, all the kids were just there, all over us and and then there was a Santa Claus and it just went on and on and they 
really accepted it into their hearts. They know that someone's giving. And that's the most important part, the way we as a group give. And we're giving and giving. And not so much on the food side with these kids. They're just all the presents. So that was great. And then we did Wellington. Wellington was another big bush Christmas. So, And that also is a hub that has another three or four remote areas. So in, all in all, um, at Peak Hill, there was an actual, um, they loved to dance. So there was this dance ceremony before the bush Christmas itself with the Santa Claus. And in the dance, they have this um, ritual where it's like glorifying, um, worshipping. So then I, had, I was able to have a word with the children and that was sort of in, encapsulating them and having into their heart a, a, a seed. So we started planting seeds. So our aim, we've been doing this for two years now. So our, our aim right now is to continue planting these seeds. And those seeds will bring out a harvest. And, um, yeah, the children so fantastic. But that, there, was about, there was about 30, 40 children, kids. Not one played up. They just sat and listened. Listened to the elders and then they gave me a mic. So they listened to me. So that was unusual, but it was good. It's good. It's good. They listened. But it was all great. So, um, yeah. So we're all part of this, and there'll be more information coming on what's happening. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done, mate. Thank you. Thank you. He's just very humble. When he says we're a part of it, it's really all him. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a real team player. Rocco, well done, mate. Awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome. Turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus is alive. And turn to the other person on the other side and say, Jesus is here. Come on. And now tell yourself... Jesus loves you. Okay, now we've passed the Sunday school level. Let's go there. <laughs> now, honestly, my, my hope and my prayer, and you've probably heard a million Christmas messages, and, and uh, we could talk all day, all night, until Jesus returns every day about the significance of Christmas and who Jesus is, and we'll never stop talking about Jesus. But my prayer today is for you. Wherever you are in your journey with Jesus, because we're all at different levels, right? And part of our role is we don't want to dump our revelation or our journey on other people because they're not where we're at. Now, we share truth. We share relationship. We share experience, testimony, we call it. But really, everyone's on their own journey. Even my wife and my children, and we live in the same house. So we're going to be careful how we present truth there's only one truth. Truth is very black and white, but it's a journey for people. Not just truth is a journey. <laughs> you might be saying, yeah, truth is settled. We can't write truth. We don't invent truth. It's not our job to change truth. There's one truth. His name is Jesus. Can you say amen? <laughs> but then people are different levels, and we, it's our job to pray for them. You know, you're in this place and you're at where you are in your walk with Jesus because someone, somewhere, prayed for you. You didn't come up with this for yourself. It's too good. You would have messed it up. I would have messed it up. As we pray for people, the Holy Spirit changes our hearts, softens our hearts. Something that you would have heard maybe a hundred times earlier at that moment, at that point, in that season of your life, it made so much sense. And it became a revelation, and you believed the truth, and that truth of the gospel set you free and gave you a rebirth. We sung it in the hymn today. Christ was born to give us a chance for the second rebirth. I mean, it's more eloquent than that, but that's basically what it said. And when you believe truth, the gospel, or who Jesus is, and we're going to go through it in a second, it changes you. It becomes from information 
to life-changing revelation. It comes from religion, which religion means to me outward rules and regulations that I feel I need to do to please God. That's religion. The Bible has a word for that. It's called dead works. And no amount of dead works you can do, external rules and practices, will ever change your heart. We've tried. I'm sure we've tried to be good. How many of you have tried to be good at least one day in your life? Yeah? <laughs> because the point is, when do you know you've done, done enough good to please a holy, righteous, perfect God? We all fall short, the Bible says. So it's not in doing good, it's this dead works. We all need a heart transplant. Amen. I don't want to get silly, yeah? I'm speaking symbolically, but we do need a brand new heart. Because the problem with us isn't that we sin, and we do sin, especially this side of the room, I just feel a lot of sin. On, I'm joking. <laughs> we do sin, but the reason we do sin is because we're born in sin, we have a sinful nature. So Jesus is all about not just changing outward behavior, which is fantastic, but if he doesn't change the core of your being, your inside person, you, the real you, then it doesn't really matter, does it? Jesus said it this way, a good tree will always bear good fruit, but a bad tree, a rotten tree, a sinful tree, will always bear bad fruit. <laughs> because out of the abundance of your heart, the fruit comes out. And I get it. And I know it's a delicate subject. And we as Christians are branded, we're narrow-minded, and we're, it's open up to a bigger worldview. And it's a, no thanks. Have you seen the world? I don't want that kind of view anymore, yeah? Amen. I'm narrow on purpose because there's one way the truth, the life, his name is Jesus. Amen. And even though the, the way to Jesus is very narrow, the way to God is very narrow, it's broad in that it's available to everyone. No other religion can make that boast, that it's available to everyone. You have to go through a, a set of rules and regulations. You have to tick the boxes. You have to do certain things in certain way, in certain sequence, in the appropriate manner, or else you're not going to cut it. Jesus says, I know you can't cut it. I know you can't live sinless. I know you can't be perfect. Let me take your place on the cross and open the way back to the Father to every single person alive and yet to come. So the message is exclusive, but it's broad in its application. It's welcome. This gospel works in any country, in any culture, in any season, any time. Because it's the truth. Yes. I'm not angry. Okay, if you don't, I'm not angry. I'll try and smile more, okay? My New Year's resolution, smile more. <laughs> Frown less. No, okay, anyway. But I know this truth. And some of in this room have known me for a long time. If it wasn't for the gospel, I wouldn't be married. I wouldn't be the father I am. I would definitely never have a mic in my hand. I wanted to run away from this call. You don't know how bad I wanted to run away. But God didn't let me, okay? And I love it, by the way. I'm not, I'm not suffering, okay? I love it. <laughs> but I know the gospel completely changed my life. I grew up in a, in a Christian home, Orthodox Greek home. We went to church Easter and Christmas Weddings and all those kind of things, and we've got baptized as kids and all that. So it's all fantastic. So I was God fearing, but never understood the gospel. I'm not anti Greek Orthodox people. I love them. Some of my good friends, actually, my, my best friend is Greek Orthodox. So I'm not anti. I'm not there to box people. I'm not there to my way at the highway. It's truth and love. Doesn't matter what church you go to. If you believe in Jesus, you're in the family of God. Can you say Amen? We need to think bigger than just our little church. And Anyway, where was I going with that, kids? <laughs> I heard the gospel. I heard the gospel as a 23-year-old male person living a life who thought we wanted to conquer the world. You know when you're 23, you want to conquer the world, right? 
were in my seat in a place like you, where you are today. In my seat, the King of Kings conquered my heart. And I saw, I heard, but for the first time I saw through revelation in my heart how much Jesus loved me. That he took the pain of the cross for me. And if you're in this room, you're listening to my voice. He did that for you this morning. You want to you know how much Jesus loves you? He stretched forth his hand for you yeah. to the right and to the left to open wide his heart to, so you can receive him. Can you say amen? amen? And in my seat, full of pride, full of, I thought I knew it all, full of, this can't be the truth. God, through the Spirit, confronted me and I started weeping like a baby. And weeping in itself isn't a really spiritual, you know what I mean? It's not in the weeping. It's I got up out of that place and my life was different. I just, things that I thought were real and meaningful and had value, it was like, no, thank you. Why would I want to do that stuff? And if you don't believe me, ask my wife. We were actually dating at that time. We've been together for four years. She knows the changes I've been through. Good and bad, you know what I mean? <laughs> changes as in, you know what I mean? And changes. <laughs> she still loves me anyway. Right? Right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit cheeky this morning. <laughs> the point of it is this. That Jesus was born on Christmas morning, and we're going to get to the scriptures, okay? Not just so we can behold the beautiful baby in the manger. And I love that, yeah? Not just so we can remember the incredible faith of Mary who actually believed the angels. And Come in, you put yourself in Mary's position. Never knew a man. The Holy Spirit comes and says, I'm going to birth something in you. And by the way, it's God himself. <laughs> what would you think if you're female? No thanks. Is there someone else she can get? There's a nice little lady down the street. Please go visit her. But she said, she said, according to thy word, let it be done. Incredible faith. Sometimes we poo poo Mary, and I don't want to be disrespectful. But she was a woman of great faith. It took faith to raise the Son of God in a home and correct him. Imagine having to correct Jesus. Imagine that. Jesus, no more Nutella, it's bad for you, okay? You only have to say it once because he's perfectly obedient, yes. <laughs> Anyway, you get the point, yeah? And Christmas is all about that, yeah? We remember those things, which is very important. We sing about them. We have nice little things on the piano about them. But that's not the purpose of Christmas. Amen. Comma. Santa Claus isn't the purpose of Christmas. Absolutely. Buying extravagant gifts for one another isn't the purpose of Christmas. And all the parents said, Amen. <laughs> Can I be a bit more cheeky? Having family barbecues isn't the reason for Christmas. Yes, we celebrate. Yes, it's, I love getting together as families. Actually, we're off to a barbecue after today. I love it. It's a beautiful occasion. We celebrate and eat and enjoy each other's company. But that's not the reason for Christmas. Public holidays is not the reason for Christmas. Even though, yes, we want some more. Boxing Day sales are not the reason for Christmas. Going to the beach is not the reason for Christmas, even though we're blessed to have a summer Christmas. Depends what you prefer, but anyway. The reason for Christmas is Jesus. Specifically, now I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Christmas specifically means that God, who, who always existed in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You can't really explain the Trinity. 
but you can understand it in your heart. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can't really explain it. There's three people, but one God. But it makes perfectly sense. Okay? Now, the second person of the Trinity is the Son of God. Always was, always will be the Son of God. He left heaven and became man, not just man, he became less than a baby in someone's womb. And we read today, we're going to turn to in a second. Why is that powerful? Why is that necessary? Why do we need God to come down and become a man? Why would God leave heaven, eternity, perfection and glory and subject himself to humanity? Remember, he's the creator. Why would he come down to his creation? Not only come down to his creation, but live a humble life of service. Not only that, go to the cross to die, not for himself, but for all of his creation who didn't even want him to die for them. One of the most saddest scriptures in the, in the scriptures. John 1 says, he came to his own, yet his own did not recognize him. Just allow that to sink in for a second. So Jesus isn't just an ordinary prophet, teacher, miracle worker. If he was, still great, but it doesn't change your life. But Jesus, or well, the Son of God, became Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. To bring us back so that we can become sons of God. That, my dear friends, is a message for Christmas. That, my dear friends, is why we give gifts. Why do we give gifts in Christmas? Not to, because we feel bad as parents and to appease our guilty conscience, we buy extravagant gifts to make up for all the bad stuff we did as parents. Not many laughs, but that's okay. We give gifts to remember that Jesus was the greatest gift ever given. Can we read a scripture? We have to read a scripture, yeah? Philly, should I read a scripture? Yeah, okay, thank you. So Matthew 1, 18. We're almost done, believe it or not. It's like Jesus coming back soon, yeah? So I'm almost done. It's my thing. Anyway, I'm joking. Now, the birth of Jesus happened in this way. After his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, so not married. They hadn't been together. Very clear, the Bible's righteous and pure. Mary was pure. She wasn't living in sin. Wasn't a cover-up for a mistake her and Joseph made. It's very clear, the Bible's very honest, Yeah? Before they came together, she was found with child by the Holy Spirit. And picture yourself, you're Joseph. Your wife, who you've never been with, or not your wife, your fiance comes to you, babe, I'm pregnant. And an angel came to me, by the way, and said, it's not your kid, obviously, and it's no one else's kid. It's actually God. Imagine you're Joseph. Then Joseph, her husband, who again, great faith. Oh, Joseph doesn't even make it into the story of Christmas most times. Joseph is the hero of this story. Because if he doesn't support his wife, believe his wife, trust in what the angels tell him, Jesus is not going to be born. We need more Josephs Amen. to protect their families. To stand up and do the right thing no matter who's looking. To stand up for truth. Come on, my husband should have said amen right then. You missed your point. 
Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make a public example because he could have legally, he could have disgraced his wife, fiance, had in mind to divorce her privately. But while the th- he thought on these things, I love that. God gives us time to think about things sometimes. We want to rush and we think God speaks and we got to do straight away and... No, sometimes God speaks or leads you in a certain way. It's good to think on them because in that space of thinking, you open your heart to the Lord. He can come and speak to you. (laughs) Well, he thought on these things. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And you know, Joseph was very afraid to take Mary as his wife. For he who is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. And she will bear a son, not an ordinary child. This child is extraordinary. It was just, something's going to set him apart. And you shall call his name Jesus, the Savior, Yeshua. For he will save people from their sins. This thing that's in Mary, it's not an unholy act. It's Holy Spirit birthed. Joseph, don't touch it. Some of us this morning, God's saying to you, don't touch it. Just leave it alone. I'm going to work it out for you. Now, all this occurred to fulfill what the Lord has spoken to the prophet. That's the prophet Isaiah, who prophesied this 750 BC. So 750 years before Christ was born, Isaiah has this prophecy. A virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call him... Emmanuel. Which means, translated, Emmanuel is with us, El is God. It really means with us, God. The way the Hebrew is written, it's the other way around, God with us. You know, Jesus fulfilled 300 and 48 Old Testament prophecies. The Bible you read every day, Jesus, one person who wasn't even born yet, who had no, right, he had no say about the Bible. And the Bible was written by, I think, 40 different authors over the space of 1,500 years. Yet this... I should have put the graph in there. There's a cross-reference graph that has 66,378 cross-references in the Bible. In other words, the Bible is incredibly linked. There's no way one person could have wrote that in that space of time, obviously. But Jesus, now picture this. Jesus, as one person living 33 years, fulfilled 348 scriptures or prophecies from the Old Testament. Now, the statistical probability of that happening is a number so big, it doesn't exist. In other words, there's no way possible one human could have fulfilled 348 Old Testament prophecies. No way possible unless he was God. (laughs) Why? Why? Because the amount of detail in the Old Testament about the birth, the life, what Jesus did, where he lived, how he was going to die. Um, there's so many, born a virgin, so many prophecies that it's actually statistically impossible for one person to fulfill them. Stuff that he had no control over, like where he was going to be born, who his parents were, how he was going to die. He couldn't control that. He couldn't say, well, I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to make sure. So God started the Christmas story, even BC, yeah? 
And all through history, God's been the architect to help us to understand that this thing we call the Christmas story is the greatest news, the best news, the greatest gift of all time. We're going to rush ahead. Romans 8.3 says, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So in other words, the second person of the Trinity became human like you and me. So what does that mean? Number one, it means that Jesus is the revelation of God. In other words, you want to see God? How many you want to see God? You can see God. I'll tell you how. You read the Bible and you see Jesus and everything Jesus did and said is the exact representation of what God in heaven would have said and would have done. He was perfect God in flesh. Someone used to always ask me on Christmas, they used to come in the service at the back and then the service used to come up to me and say, if God's real, why don't he just come and just appear and show us who he is? And for years it used to baffle me because I think, well, surely you can read the Bible, surely. You know. But one day, I wised up. <laughs> I wised up. And I said to him, you know what? God did come down and reveal himself in the person of Jesus. You want to see God? Look at Jesus. Jesus said exactly. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus reveals God. Jesus is God's final message. God doesn't need to speak again. And I know as a Father, He leads us and He guides us. But there's no further record of Scripture needed because Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Scriptures. Can you say amen? Everything points to Jesus. The only thing that's left is the Scriptures that are yet to be fulfilled with Jesus' return. Well, they're coming quicker than what we think. Jesus one day will pierce the sky. He will descend with all the angels following Him. The cloud of witnesses. He's going to pierce the heavens. And every eye will see him. I don't know how that's going to happen. But every eye on the planet will see Jesus. Even those who pierced him. And at that moment, every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can you say amen? Now that's going to happen. Not fairy tale. It's actually going to happen. Number two, so revelation. Number two is reconciliation. I just want to talk about reconciliation for the next couple of minutes, and we're done. So Jesus was born to reconcile us back to God. The whole reason for Christmas. So Jesus was born, God, he was God, born perfect, stayed perfect. Jesus never sinned. He never swore. He never lied. There's an account of his life. There was 12 people that followed him for three and a half years very closely, looking for him to stumble. There was a whole group of Pharisees and Sadducees and wouldn't sees and couldn't sees. They were following him just to make him stumble. He never stumbled once. (laughs) Perfect. He stayed perfect. And he made his, his mission to go to the cross because he knew the cross was the instrument of salvation for all of his creation. He went to the cross, took your place. Have you ever read the account of how excruciating and cruel the cross is, was? It was basically you die by asphyxiation, like you couldn't breathe anymore. You're on the cross, you're nailed, hands and feet. And the way you stay alive on the cross is you have to push yourself up up to allow air to come into your lungs. And they're there for hours. Not only that, obviously before they used to go on the cross, whipped, beard plugged out, crowns of thorns. I mean, Jesus had all his flesh ripped open. He was so 
tortured for you and for me that the Bible says you couldn't recognize his appearance as a human anymore. And he's on the cross, not for himself. He's perfect, remember? For you and for me. And still his love is oozing out of him. On the cross he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And you push yourself up to breathe. <laughs> Eventually, you run out of strength. You stop breathing. That's why in the, in the camp, it goes, the, the storm came, darkness came, and the Sabbath was coming near. The, the centurion told the soldiers, go around to the, soldier, uh, to the guys crucified and break their legs. Why break their legs? Because you break their legs, all of a sudden you can't push yourself up anymore. You die instantly. So they went to the left, broke his legs, the guy died. Went to the right, broke his legs, the guy died. They got to Jesus, he was already dead. Why? Right, because the scripture said, no one takes his life from him. <laughs> he gave his life up for us. Not he was murdered. He willingly gave himself for you and for me. They get to Jesus, he's already dead. So just to make sure... They pierced his side again to fulfill scripture. Yeah. And blood and water came out. It was already dead. Now all that, to say three, he was buried. Three days later, he rose. We know he defeated death. And he rose the victorious king of kings. No longer the, the baby in the manger. Now he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the resurrected, glorified one. <laughs> his eyes are like fire. He's full of glory. Come on. That Jesus wants to offer you a gift today, and it's called reconciliation. Let's read the scriptures. Second Corinthians 5. One of my favorite scriptures. Not really a Christmas scripture, but hey, I'll get the mic so I get to choose the scriptures, yeah? Second Corinthians 5 says, for Christ's love compels us. That's a great motive for everything. Not I have to come to church, not I have to be generous, not I have to serve, not I have to love that person. Christ's love compels me. In other words, I love serving people, I love coming, you know what I mean? It's a beautiful motivation, that's not what I'm talking about, moving on. Because we are convinced that one died for all, one, capital O, one died for all, and therefore all died. And follow the logic here. So if Jesus died for you, in God's mind, you've died with him. And he died that all those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. In other words, when we come to Christ, we exchange our life for his life. But before we do that, we've got to give ourselves over to Him. In other words, we've got to give Him control over our life. And that's what it means to make Jesus Lord over your life. When you make Jesus Lord, you give up the right to be in control of your life. Now, we're scared to preach this message because it offends people. But I'm not here to offend you. I'm here to give you the truth. Unless you make Jesus Lord, I don't know if you're really his follower. How can you follow Jesus if you haven't made him your Lord? <laughs> yeah, I know it's a process, but we start with death. We start to, Lord, my life belongs to you. Therefore, because we've understood this, because we've died to self, we've died to sin, we've given, rel relinquished control of my life to my Lord. Now, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Sometimes we're too quick to preach you're a new creation in Christ before realizing actually before you're a new creature, you have to die to yourself. There can't be a resurrection without a death. You can't be saved unless you know you're drowning. You can't receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior unless you know you need him. Number one, you need him. 
I need him, you need him, the whole world needs him. Our prayer is that you recognize you need him. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to reveal that to us. Like he did to me all those years ago. And a beautiful illustration of this is if someone was drowning in Bondi Beach, God forbid it doesn't happen in any of our beaches, too many drownings happen. Swim between the flags, okay? Stay safe this summer. I don't know where that came from, but anyway, it's an important message. <laughs> if someone's drowning and they're holding on to a, a rotten little, little piece of wood like this, now can that little piece of wood save them? But it's all they've got. So they think, well, I'm going to hold on to this thing because it's all I've got and I'm going to give it my best to get saved. And a lifeguard comes along with a flotation device and says, hey, I'm here to save you. I'm here to save you. I'm here to take you to safety and save you from drowning. Do you want to come with me? Yes. We well, need to let go of what you're holding on to. Because if you don't let go, what you're trusting in to save you, which is repentance, you cannot believe and grab a hold of what Jesus has for you. Too many of us are trying to do this and we're trying to grab onto Jesus. Let me hold on to this and let me hold on to this. Well, you're going to fall deeper into the water. Let me make it very simple for you. Let go of everything else you're trusting in, your works, your morality, your education, your goodness. Some of us are trusting in our goodness and we're holding on to it like this. Surely God will have mercy on me because I'm a good person. Let me tell you, there's lots of good person, people, persons, people in hell. Because being good doesn't qualify you for saving. You need to let go. Let go and say, God, there's no reason that qualifies me to enter into your kingdom. I want to take a hold of your son, Jesus. And we grab a hold of that flotation device. Can you say amen? Almost done. (laughs) Jesus removed separation that our sins separate us from God. Jesus removed it. Number two, Jesus provided forgiveness for us. Jesus has totally forgiven us. Good news, right? This Christmas... Can we extend forgiveness to people in, in our lives? Let's be nice to them. Let's not hold grudges. But important to remember that God in Christ has forgiven you because of Jesus' sacrifice. Number three, Jesus cleansed our co- guilty conscience. And if you're anything like me, and it came up in the prayer meeting, I think Phil mentioned it, the, the enemy reminds us of all this bad stuff we've done. Anyone on, yeah. The reason for that is he wants to, us to disqualify ourselves from receiving from, from the Lord. And let me settle it for you once and for all. You are always going to be disqualified from receiving anything from the Lord outside of Jesus. Yeah. It's not your goodness that qualifies you. It's what Jesus has done for you. Amen. So allow yourself to be free from a guilty conscience. Craig, I've been, that's for you, brother. It's for all of us. Just for the Lord's just on you this, this morning. A guilty conscience pushes us away from God, pushes us away from each other. When Adam sinned, the first thing he did was not got on Facebook and took selfies and he was in mourning 
grieving because sin destroys you. We think sin is pleasurable, and it is for a season or a moment or a second, but then it destroys you. It's got like big hooks, and it comes in and grabs you and destroys you. When Adam sinned, he wasn't chucking a party with ACDC playing. He was hiding from God and hiding from his wife. Why? Because guilt came into his being. Sin produces guilt, which then produces shame. Guilt is because of what I've done. Shame is because of who I am. Guilt because I've wronged. Shame because it stained me as a person. Now I've got condemnation, shame. Jesus today... Because of Christmas, wants to come into your heart and cleanse your guilty conscience. So you can approach God with freedom and confidence. And I tell you, when you understand that, it doesn't make you arrogant. It doesn't make you want to go out and sin more. It humbles you because it breaks you. And you go to Jesus and say, Lord, cleanse me. Help me. Never to do that again. Empower me to walk holy like you are holy. Yeah, I said holy in church, yeah? <laughs> Cleanse me. And I tell you, when your soul gets released from guilt, you'll be free as a bird. Amen. And no one can ever stop you. No one can ever put their junk on you and their condemnation and try and keep you down. All the ceilings of your life get removed. Why? Because your soul finds true freedom. I remember the day and the place and where I was, how old I was, what I was wearing, what I was thinking, the moment this became true to me. And I tell you what stuck out because I was in my room, just became a Christian. I was reading the Bible myself and these truths started coming real to me. And I was in my room. My dad He's passed away, he's in glory. He gave his life to Jesus three days before he passed away. Praise the Lord. He's in glory. He was in the other part of the room. And this became true. Some of you heard the story. And I started shouting and dancing. And I'm free, Jesus, I'm free. I'm free, I'm free. No more guilt, no more shame. No more having to measure up to some external standard. Jesus, I'm free. I'm right in your presence, not because of what I've done, but because of what you've done, Jesus. And I have confidence to approach you. And my dad kind of made his way. He's knocking. Are you okay, son? (laughs) I open the door, say, Dad, I'm the best I've ever been. No alcohol, no drugs needed. No external pick-me-ups. We found Jesus, amen? Well, he found us more importantly. But allow, even this place, allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse your guilty conscience. And number four, which is very close to that, he's made us his righteousness. There's only two types of righteousness. There's self-righteousness and there's God kind of righteousness. And when you become a Christian and you give your life to Jesus and you make him your Lord, you become as righteous as Jesus is right now. And I know that takes a lot of faith to believe that, especially on this side of the room because you've been through a lot. But it's the truth and it's the message of Christmas. That when God sees you, when you relate to God now under the New Testament, New Covenant, when you're his child, he doesn't treat you as the sinner you were or what you deserve. Because if he did, none of us would ever qualify. Now in the New Testament, because we're new creations, we've submitted, we've repented, we've believed the gospel, we walk in holiness, we walk in truth, we walk in who Jesus is, we become the righteousness of God. We never ever have to earn our place before our Father. We never have to merit anything the Lord does in terms of blessing and favor towards us in terms of relationship. 
We have roles and responsibilities. We've got commitments we need to honor. We need to follow truth. We need to follow the word. But it's out of this place of security that I'm already the righteousness of God. I don't obey to become more righteous because then I'm trusting in my righteousness. I'm already righteous, therefore I obey. That makes sense? That's the message of Christmas. What do we do about it? I posted something on Facebook this week, and I don't often post, but I honored my word when I said we got to get on social media and post truth more regularly. So I said, you know what, I've got to do that. <laughs> get the gospel out there a bit more. And I said, one of Jesus' favorite sayings were, were, was, come to me. He'd say, come to me if you're thirsty. <laughs> come to me if you're heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. So Jesus made all of it. Time's up, is it? Okay, close your Bibles. <laughs> Jesus doesn't want us to go to other humans and institutions and organizations, even though everything it can help us. But he wants us, he came because he wants us to go to him. So Christmas is about us going back to him. Yeah. And receiving the gift. We heard Isaiah 9, 6, unto us, a child is born and a son is given. Incredible gift. John 1, 12 says, to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, we've got to receive the gift. Yeah. Let me tell you the, the quickest way to, to dishonor a gift giver is not to receive the gift. Doesn't matter what it is. You want to offend someone real quick? Don't receive their gift. It's offensive. I want to choose to give you this. Can you receive it? This morning, let's not offend God. Let's receive the gift he's given. His name is Jesus. Let us go to him. Let's stop hiding. The way we come, we stop hiding. We come as we are. We admit, which is turning away, letting go of anything that we're trusting in to save us. We humble ourselves, acknowledge our need of him. We turn from evil, sin, and wrongdoing. We admit that we need help. Number one. Number two, we believe. We turn to God. So we turn away to turn to God in faith by believing in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus did really die, he did really raise again, and he's coming back. We need to believe in our hearts. And number three is confess, A, B, C, confess, make a decision. I should have said they're a quality decision, because sometimes we're quick in making decisions, but sometimes we might say we need to think about some things. You need to think about what becoming a Christian is really all about. Are you wanting to become a Christian to make your life easier? To have a better life? To be part of this awesome community we call church? They're all good reasons, but they're not biblical reasons to come to Jesus. Can you say amen? Believe in your heart and make a quality decision. Christianity is actually going to cost you everything. I don't want to sugarcoat for anyone. Christianity will cost you everything. Why? Because we give our whole life to the Lord. Yeah. Not just our Sunday life. Not just our 10% or whatever, 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 whatever. Christianity will cost you your whole life. Are you willing to give up your life to follow His life for you? For you, he's playing for your life. Do we make a quality decision to follow Jesus by confessing him as your Lord and Savior? From this day forward, Lord, I follow you. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. I think a, a good explanation for Christianity is Christians are just, we're, we're beggars who are telling other beggars 
where the food is. That's all a Christian is. We're not any better than non-Christians and we're not here to divide. And We're here to say, actually, we've found the source of life. Let me lead you to him. Can you say amen? <laughs> Let me give you some hope. You know, people need some hope in our day and age. They need some courage. They need some good news. This life is like a, a vapor of smoke. One day here, next day gone. And I was thinking about this the other day and I'm finished. There it is there. <laughs> How many people have tried to rule the world through the ages? It's always been, I think, an innate a, a desire in, in people's hearts, especially leaders, worldly leaders, to want to try and rule the world. And we've seen it through history. Many have tried. Some have been successful for a season. <laughs> But let me tell you this, one day, the real ruler of the world will come back, yeah. and ain't no one going to dethrone him. Can you say amen? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we stand? This morning, you've heard a message about Christmas, true meaning, you've heard the gospel. Some uh, words came through in the prayer meeting that we feel the Lord wants to heal hearts tonight, today. So if you're suffering with anxiety, there's something wrong with your inner heart, and not your organ in terms of your heart, your emotions. God wants to heal you today, set you free from anxiety, depression. But also... If there's something wrong with your physical heart, your organ, <laughs> we want to pray for you as well. I mean, if what we're saying is true, Jesus is alive. He's here to not only save us spiritually, which is so important, but he's here to save us physically, which is healing our physical bodies. So we want to make room for that after the service. If you want some prayer for healing of your heart, physical or emotional, come to the front, please. But before we do that, I'm going to ask every person to bow their heads before the Lord and close their eyes. If you're on YouTube, there's a number coming on your screen. I'm going to invite you to make Jesus Lord of your life today. You might have heard the gospel before but never been in a position to understand or respond. Today could be your day. I'm going to pray a prayer. If you want to make Jesus Lord of your life today, I'm going to ask you to repeat that prayer. And I'll just say it, repeating it, but mean it with your heart. Take to heart these words, and you can make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. Repeat after me God, I know I am a sinner. And I'm sorry for the sins I've committed. And I know my sins have put a distance between you and me. And I know that I cannot save myself. Only your son, Jesus, can save me and eliminate the distance between us. I believe he is your son who died for my sins and rose from the dead. I receive Jesus as my Savior and confess Him as my Lord. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me and giving me eternal life. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you've prayed that for the first time and you prayed it with your heart, please let someone know. Go up to someone, maybe someone at the front here, or come and let me know after the meeting. We'd love to help you in your relationship and journey with the Lord because it's important that you have community around you to help you during this time. Yeah? Are we good? 
And if you need prayer for your heart, physical, remember, emotional, please, we'll open up the front here, come and get some prayer. I'll ask some of the guys to be ready on standby for that. God bless you. Merry Christmas. And we'll see you on the other side. Feel free to hang around for some snacks and coffee. God bless you.